It is commonly asserted that our knowledge of the deep oceans is eclipsed by what we know about the moon's surface. A parallel sentiment holds true for our atmosphere, as evidenced by the astonishing facts that a colossal phenomena like sprites eluded detection until the 1990s, followed by the revelation of even larger gigantic jets in 2002. The subsequent discovery of thunderstorms generating powerful X-ray flashes further underscores our limited understanding of the atmospheric intricacies. In this new series, I aim to unravel some of the mysteries surrounding our atmosphere, beginning with an exploration of the enigmatic world of lightning. Despite its universal familiarity, lightning remains veiled in numerous unresolved mysteries. In this first episode, we will focus on the perplexing question of what triggers lightning, a fundamental enigma in the realm of lightning physics. The challenge lies in the inadequacy of the electric field measurements to fully elucidate the genesis of a lightning flash. Thunderstorm clouds accumulate electric charges, yet air, acting as a proficient insulator, hinders electrons from equalizing these electrostatic imbalances. When a pathway of ionized air molecules emerges, it acts as a conductor, bridging different parts within a cloud and connecting the cloud to ground, ultimately giving rise to a lightning bolt. The mechanisms initiating these pathways remains a topic of debate. While powerful electric fields can cause insulators to spontaneously undergo breakdown and become conductors, air requires hundreds of thousands of volts or more for such breakdowns. Measurements show that the electric field generated in thunderstorm clouds are not high enough to trigger breakdown in air. Consequently, many experts lean towards the hypothesis that an external trigger must be involved in inducing lightning within our atmosphere. Let's explore some of the possible trigger mechanisms. One proposed concept suggests the presence of ice particles or liquids referred to as hydrometeors within thunderstorms. These hydrometeors may play a role in diminishing the necessary electric field strength for electrical breakdown. The charges on these particles and the polarization of water contribute to enhancing the electric field in the vicinity of the hydrometeor surface. Individual hydrometeors have been observed to occasionally carry charges of up to 40 picocoulombs. There is a maximum charge limit for a raindrop before the electrostatic force exceeds the surface tension, causing the drop to break apart. The electric fields near the surface of hydrometers owing to their charges could potentially exceed the local breakdown field. However, surpassing the breakdown field near the hydrometer's surface does not guarantee electrical breakdown, as the electric field diminishes rapidly with distance. This diminishment is even more rapid for fields near the points of ice shards. While the field required for the initiation of an electric discharge near the hydrometeor's surface is less than that needed for the stream of formation, it is conceivable that the field near the hydrometeor may discharge before the streamer can form. Falling charge droplets may develop instabilities creating sharp points that generate large dielectric constants in a very small region near these points. These points can produce a corona that diminishes the charge on the droplet. Griffith and Latham conducted laboratory experiments using ice particles and discovered that the corona initiates with a positive discharge of regularly spaced onset streamer pulses. These streamers either terminate in the air gap or at the negative electrode. Despite applying a strong electric field on the ice particles for extended periods, burst pulses and glow-like discharges occurred along with accompanying negative discharges. However, the gap did not break down highlighting that a vigorous corona discharge from hydrometeors does not guarantee a spark breakdown. Loeb has theorized that a collection of positively charged raindrops carried by an updraft towards a negative charge center could initiate positive streamers, propagating upwards and outwards towards the negative charge. The idea of positive streamers producing propagating regions that intensify the electric field has been scrutinized by others who question its feasibility due to the requirement for an unrealistically large number of droplets to form. Electrons suspended in the air typically have a mean free path of about one centimeter. When these electrons attain velocities approaching a fraction of the speed of light, their mean free path can increase by up to a hundred times. 
This enhanced mobility enables them to accelerate within an existing electric field to energies far surpassing those of static electrons. Upon collision with an air molecule, such relativistic electrons can liberate additional relativistic electrons, setting up a cascade of runaway electrons. The theory posits that these electrons could be a catalyst for electric breakdown in thunderstorms. However, due to the elastic scattering, electrons do not follow a straight path along the field lines, resulting in an underestimation of the field required to initiate the runaway electron phenomena. Contrary to a common misconception, reaching the relativistic runaway electron avalanche threshold does not automatically guarantee electrical breakdown. To generate a significant number of runaway electrons, the electric field must exceed the threshold of a multiple avalanche length, not just one. Several encouraging observations support this theory. Frequent detection of gamma ray glow from thunderclouds serves as a potential indicator of the presence of these relativistic electrons. Even if the avalanche fails to initiate lightning, its impact on the cloud's conductivity may be substantial. The relativistic feedback mechanism mirrors the Townsend discharge, allowing the self-sustained production of runaway electrons and resulting in an explosive increase in the quantities of energetic electrons and gamma rays. Cosmic rays are high-energy particles hurtling through space at velocities approaching the speed of light. They emanate from various sources including the Sun, our own Milky Way galaxy and even galaxies located at vast distances. The underlying concept is that these particles possess sufficient energy to penetrate Earth's atmosphere and ionize air molecules. If one of the electrons begins its journey with enough initial energy and continues to gain energy while navigating the electric field, such as one found in a thunderstorm, it can trigger the excitation of new free electrons, some of which acquire enough energy to break free. This process sets off a cascading influx of high-energy electrons that rapidly multiplies as they traverse the electric field. In 1995, multiple measurements taken from balloon-borne electric field assessments revealed that the electric field within a thunderstorm seldom surpasses the critical value required to initiate an electron avalanche, pointing towards a cosmic ray origin. In 2009, Konis conducted a comparison between the data obtained from the National Lightning Detection Network and cosmic ray data, revealing a correlation between monthly lightning flashes and monthly galactic cosmic ray flux during the winter season. However, researchers like Dwyer, Babbage and others have demonstrated that while relativistic runaway electron avalanches initiated by cosmic rays can eventually lead to regions with intensified electric fields, they are incapable of directly instigating lightning. This limitation arises because the low energy electrons produced by the relativistic runaway electron avalanches are too dispersed to substantially impact the conductivity of a thunderstorm. In 2016, Ryson and his colleagues investigated the initial breakdown of numerous lightning flashes using a lightning map array and a lightning interferometer and their findings indicated that all lightning flashes were triggered by fast positive breakdown, thereby excluding the possibility of initiation by relativistic runaway electron avalanches. As high-speed solar wind particles traverse space, some among them exhibit even greater velocities, earning them the designation of solar energetic particles. These exceptionally energetic particles possess the capability to breach Earth's magnetic field and traverse the atmosphere to altitudes where thunderclouds congregate. Within these atmospheric realms, the particles may initiate collisions with airborne atoms, setting in motion a cascade of high-energy particles. In a 2014 study, Scott and his colleagues delved into the records of lightning strikes within a 500km radius encompassing central England. They conducted a comparative analysis by juxtaposing the frequency of lightning bolts with the data from NASA's A spacecraft, which monitors the influx of solar wind streams reaching Earth. Their findings unveiled a noteworthy pattern. An average of 422 lightning bolts per day manifested in the 40 days following the arrival of a high-speed solar wind stream at Earth, while during the preceding 40 days there was an average of only 321 lightning strikes per day. 
Recent research has revealed an intriguing correlation between the direction of the sun's magnetic field and lightning rates. On the days when the sun's magnetic field was oriented towards Earth, the lightning rates were found to be approximately 50% higher compared to days when the magnetic field pointed away from our planet. The sun's magnetic field undergoes a polarity reversal along a convoluted spiral expanse known as the heliospheric current sheet, extending throughout the solar system and occasionally intersecting Earth's orbit. Over a span of seven years, scientists diligently monitor the fluctuations in hourly lightning rates as the heliospheric current sheet traversed through. Throughout this period, the current sheet intersected Earth on 141 occasions. Of these interactions, the Sun's magnetic field shifted directions, 75 times pointing towards the Earth and 66 times pointing in the opposite direction. Remarkably, their analysis led to the discovery that thunderstorms tended to reach their peak activity within one to two days following each passage of the heliospheric current sheet. As the electric field builds, small streamers develop which elongate ionized regions of about 10 meters in length. These are capable of locally enhancing the electric field at its extremities. This field enhancement is the main prerequisite for the formation of a hot self-propagating leader channel. These can either be positive or negative streamers. Numerous hypotheses regarding the initiation of lightning within thunderstorm clouds often focus on the initiation of a single positive streamer, yet they fail to elucidate how it avoids decay and evolves into a leader channel. It's well established that positive streamers can propagate in weaker electric fields in comparison to negative ones, causing them to form earlier than the negative counterparts in natural conditions. For electric fields near the critical threshold, the velocity of streamer propagation is approximately 10 to the 5 meters per second. However, the rapid attraction of free electrons to atmospheric oxygen results in the streamer's conductivity remaining significant for only a few centimeters behind its leading edge. Consequently, solitary streamers cannot transport a substantial charge over significant distances. Additionally, since individual streamers propagate without significantly heating the surrounding air, the mere presence of streamers does not guarantee the formation of a hot leader channel. In laboratory settings, the leaders are generated when a network of streamers emitted from a small region near a metal electrode achieves a sufficiently high aggregate current density. The mechanisms of streamer leader transition in thunderstorm clouds devoid of metal electrodes remains unclear. A cold and weakly conducting streamer channel alone cannot create a leader. It necessitates the establishment of an extensive network of streamer channels. This network formation is feasible only in the presence of a sufficiently strong external electric field. The spatiotemporal network of streamer discharge that forms within a thunderstorm cloud represents a hierarchical system of interacting channels. As the external electric field intensifies, its influence on the streamer network becomes more pronounced facilitating the interaction and clustering of streamers. Consequently, hot segments emerge within the network, polarizing and extending along the direction of the external field. Because the growth dynamics of the leader channel are determined by the streamer zone or corona extending from its head, the inherent asymmetry in the polarity of the streamers results in the asymmetry of the leader discharge. Observations indicate that the streamer zone of a laboratory positive leader comprises exclusively positive streamers, with the propagation of positive leaders being either continuous or stepwise. Conversely, negative leaders propagating in undisturbed air consistently exhibit stepwise characteristics. During the formation process, observations of both long spark and lightning discharges in the laboratory suggest that, unlike positive leaders, a streamer zone of negative leaders simultaneously contain streamers of both polarities. The subsequent stage involves the joining of the positive part of the channel of a bipolar spatial leader with the channel of the negative leader. Despite numerous laboratory experiments on the propagation of negative sparks, a definitive mechanism explaining the emergence of spatial stems in front of the head of the negative leader has not been established. Seasoned experts in the field of gas discharge physics have resorted to the phrase almost mystical 
to characterize the emission pattern of positive and negative streamers by spatial stems isolated from the leader channel. At this stage, the initial discharge trigger remains unclear. It is known that the electric fields measured within clouds are not of sufficient magnitude to account for a straightforward breakdown process, and likely a combination of factors is at play. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.